Good afternoon and uh, welcome to the latest ASM Meet the Policy series. Uh, this is a webinar that connects ASM members with policymakers. Um, so my name is uh, Jay Lennon. I'm a professor of biology at Indiana University. I'm also uh, chairing the American Academy of Microbiology's Climate Change Task Force. Um, this is uh, a portfolio that was developed in 2021 uh, based on feedback from fellows of the American Academy for Microbiology. Um, it's unique in that it's a five-year plan. Uh, it's uh, intended to, to build a scientific portfolio uh, exclusively and explicitly on the topic of, of climate change and uh, microbes. Um, so when we started this portfolio, we were pretty explicit about trying to come up with um, um, three broad goals. Um, so the first is to strengthen the scientific uh, understanding and foundations regarding the, the fundamental role that microbes play in climate change. Um, second, uh, in collaboration with ASM policy groups, we wanted to use that scientific information for uh, development of policy and to guide advocacy efforts. Um, and third, uh, we wanted to inspire product innovation and accelerate the development of microbe-based solutions to mitigate the climate change crisis. Uh, so there's a lot of things that we've been doing uh, over the past uh, three years as part of the scientific portfolio. Uh, we've released uh, a number of reports, uh, and three specifically related to climate change and microbes, uh, the mitigation of methane emissions, um, and also an another report that was about the incorporation of microbes into Earth system models, which are often used to guide uh, policy decisions. Uh, accompanying the Academy's climate reports, uh, the Academy released a climate policy paper in, in 2022, uh, which provided recommendations to support research on microbes and how to leverage them uh, in a powerful way to support climate resilient systems. Um, each month, uh, we compile uh, some of the scientific literature, the, the newest peer-reviewed literature that comes out into a report that we circulate for those who are signed up for a climate change mailing list. Uh, in addition to circulating and distributing those through through social media. Um, last year, we had a big event uh, with the, the annual meeting in Houston of microbe where we hosted a guest track uh, that was entirely focused on climate change and microbes. Um, so a large portion of the uh, of the meeting was dedicated to this topic. And in, um, in, in, in Atlanta, Georgia this year, in June, we'll continue with having additional climate change related sessions, um, focusing on the science um, related to these topics. Um, so moving forward, uh, two months ago in November, 2023, the US Global Change Research Program released its fifth national climate assessment. Uh, so in today's webinar, we have NCA authors who will explain the report's uh, developmental process uh, and report some of the top line findings along with a preview on some of the details of health and agricultural chapters. And so uh, the three panelists that we have today, I'm gonna briefly introduce before I hand it off. Uh, first, we have uh, Dr. Aaron Grade, uh, staff scientist for the US Global Change Research Program. Uh, there he serves as a point of contact for multiple chapter teams for the fifth national climate assessment. Uh, provides public engagement and outreach support, technical expertise in urban ecology, biodiversity conservation, and coupled human natural systems and global land use change. Um, second, we have Dr. Alan Franz Luber, in research ecologist with the USDA uh, Agricultural Research Service. Um, his research uh, focuses primarily in soil ecology and the management and has leadership roles in USD South, Southeast Region Climate Hub. Um, and he served as an author on the agricultural chapter for the National Climate Assessment. Uh, last, uh, Dr. Morgan Gorris, a staff scientist at Los Alamos National Laboratory, uh, studies geohealth, which is at the nexus of health, humans, and earth systems. Um, he focuses on weather and climate effects on environmental and infectious disease dynamics. And Morgan was an author for the human health chapter on the fifth national climate um, assessment. Uh, so just a few housekeeping points before we get started. Uh, we're first going to hear um, summaries from each of the three people that I just introduced. Uh, we're going to have time after that for presentation for questions and a few high-level questions, really, you know, about 10 minutes. Um, and so if you have questions along the way, you can put those in the chat and I'll try to monitor them or you'll have an opportunity to raise your hand afterwards. Um, and after that, we'll have hopefully some time for discussion um, of the report's findings and in breakout rooms and members of other stakeholders on the call who might um, find those uh, useful for their work. 
Um, so now I'd like to um, hand this off to, um, to Dr. Gray to, to guide us through the presentations of the webinar. Thank you so much, and thank you for having me here. I'm, I'm super excited to be here uh, representing the U.S. Global Change Research Program. And I will kind of give a, a quick high-level overview of what is the National Climate Assessment and why does it exist and uh, what's so exciting about the fifth one. Um, the U.S. Global Change Research Program and the National Climate Assessment are both congressional mandates. And so the, the law was the Global Change Research Act of 1990. And it was developed to assist the nation and the world to understand, assess, predict, and respond to human-induced and natural processes of global change. We were um, 13 agencies for a while, but now the program convenes 15 agencies. You could see them all there at the bottom to advance climate and global change science and to provide useful and usable information to decision makers. And that same law that established USGCRP also mandates a periodic scientific assessment known as the National Climate Assessment. We call it NCA. NCA is a quadrennial report and it's supposed to analyze the effects of global change on several sectors. And those include, but definitely aren't limited to, the natural environment, agriculture, energy, land and water resources, transportation, human health, social systems, and biodiversity. We're charged with assessing current trends as well as projections for the next 25 to 100 years. And I will say that the NCA is used by a huge and diverse amount of users, including organizations and individuals like national, national policymakers. Uh, the private sector uses it for risk management, local mitigation and ad adaptation planning, local regional governments, um, practitioners, utility managers, and educators even use it to, um, to uh, build classes about climate change. So there, there's, um, those are just some of the many ways that NCA has been used. And kind of walking through the history real quick, um, the law was established in 1990. The first NCA was in 2001, and we are on the fifth one right now. Um, and you can also see we've had some sustained assessment special reports throughout. Uh, we've, we, we had a um, US food system one, one on human health, um, a climate science special report, and a carbon cycle specific report. So we're we have our five national climate assessments, and then USGCRP also does special assessments as well. And um, if you take a look at the table of contents for NCA5, the features highlighted in blue are new uh, as of this last cycle. Um, like previous NCAs, we cover national level topics, and you could see that from the water chapter up into the the uh, social systems and justice chapter. Um, we have regional chapters for each region of the United States, and we have response actions, um, the adaptation and mitigation chapters. Uh, at the very beginning, we have an overview and two physical science chapters. Uh, at this point, we also have um, two new chapters, one on economics and one on social systems and justice. And we also tried a, a new, um, method of kind of integrating across chapters by having these focus feature boxes. And there's one on compound extreme events, one on Western wildfires, COVID-19, supply chains, and blue carbon. In addition, we have several appendices, including a new one dedicated to climate indicators. And I've taken the liberty of just highlighting off the top of my head a few chapters, which I think explicitly cover uh, microbiology. And I will have to say this is probably not comprehensive. I'm pretty sure that forests, land cover, land use, and many of the regional chapters as well also cover it. Um, but this is just, again, an idea of how it's kind of woven throughout the, the assessment. And we have uh, two chapter authors here, that one from the um, agriculture and one from health, who will talk more about those chapters. But certainly, um, I would recommend diving into the assessment. It, it's on a very usable website and you can check out whatever subject you're interested in. Now to go over kind of what the National Climate Assessment is and the basics of it, um, it's 
purpose is really to evaluate a wide range of scientific and technical inputs and from diverse and authoritative search, search uh, sources. And the authors have to apply the best judgment to characterize certainty based on those sor sources. So it it isn't um, it isn't its own original research. It, it is a compilation of the research thus far on the topic. Um, it's relevant for policy and decision making, but we are not meant to prescribe specific policy interventions or advocate for a particular viewpoint. So it's uh, policy neutral, but also policy relevant. It's uh, assessing a wide range of potential impacts to help decision makers identify risks that could be avoided or reduced. And we do have to be fully compliant with the GCRA. Um, we also provide multiple opportunities for public engagement, which um, when NCA6 is spun up soon, you may be able to get a chance to engage on the content of NCA6. And then it undergoes extensive review, um, including several public comment periods, a review by the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, and then several government science reviews as well. And I will say uh, we're really proud to say that NCA5 was written by 500 authors and 260 technical contributors. And the contributors represent every state in the nation, as well as Puerto Rico, the U.S. Virgin Islands, Guam, and Palau, which is super exciting. Um, some key takeaways from the fifth national climate assessment and uh, the overview chapter is a great place to start if you want to um, think about how this overall assessment is framed. Um, we kind of jump right in and say the U.S. is already taking action on climate change. We're seeing actions happening already on the ground, but we are also experiencing increased risks from extreme events. Uh, climate change exacerbates social inequities. And available mitigation strategies can deliver substantial emissions reductions, but additional opportunities are needed to reach net zero. And uh, certainly in the mitigation chapter, um, microbes are mentioned as well. And climate action is an opportunity to create a more resilient and just nation. So focus on um, adaptation and mitigation to climate while thinking about resilience and social justice as well couple um, high-level scientific advancements. First, uh, way more social science in this assessment than ever before. So we have two new chapters, one on economics and one on social systems and justice. And they both really helped provide a framework of, of social science content throughout the report. We also have our advancement in understanding observed and projected climate change. For example, narrowed climate sensitivity um, and extreme event attribution, which is an exciting and, and fairly new advent. Um, exploring themes of environmental justice and equity throughout the entire assessment, all chapters pretty much, and highlighting local and state at mitigation and adaptation actions, either in case studies or other examples. We also have some fun and uh, great creative communication tools. Um, that for the first time ever, the assessment is translated entirely into Spanish. Uh, that's ongoing right now. And uh, we have improved accessibility and functionality. We had our first ever call for visual art and a poem startlement written by the uh, 24th U.S. Poet Laureate, Ada Limon. Um, we have an interactive online atlas that allows users to generate and download their own regional and local maps. And then we even um, produce six podcast episodes featuring interviews with authors, staff, and artists. And we have an audiobook recording of the overview chapter in case you're out walking your dog or something, you just want to listen to the assessment rather than read it. Right. So uh, finally, we will we can go over this in more detail, but a lot of folks want to know, how can I be involved in NCA? Uh, as mentioned, NCA 5 is out. And we're already starting to think about the sixth national climate assessment. And so the best thing to do is just uh, scan this QR code here and sign up for the USGCRP newsletter. And you'll stay up to date on any public calls for comment or author nominations or anything like that if you want to be involved um, in any capacity. Once, you, once these calls come out, it's a great opportunity to nominate yourself or others to either be an author or if you're kind of early career and don't have the bandwidth to um, commit to be an author, you could also be a review editor for the assessment. 
Um, definitely responding to calls for public comment, especially a review of the drafts using your scientific expertise. And then, of course, um, as we roll out the fifth National Climate Assessment, please join our webinars and workshops. And you're already, you're already part there um, joining this webinar right now. All right, and I'll take questions at the end, but um, yeah, definitely visit the Climate Assessment page and sign up for our newsletter and follow us on all the socials. I'll turn it over um, to Alan to kick us off on the agriculture, food systems and rural communities chapter. Very good, thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Jay. Thank you for the American Society for Microbiology for having us. I'm pleased to represent the agriculture chapter, but I'm not, certainly not the sole author and not the lead author either. Our, our chapter focuses on agriculture. Agriculture, of course, touches everybody, whether that's uh, in your work or how you eat. Uh, but it, it's uh, also, uh, it touches everyone because of the, the large footprint that it has on, on the landscape. Aaron, next please. Our chapter team was led by Carl Bolster at uh, USDA A ARS in Kentucky, and it was coordinated by Rob Mitchell, ARS in Lincoln, Nebraska. And we have a range of uh, USDA and NOAA authors on the, on the team, and they were all very useful to provide different perspectives. Next, please. We have three key messages in the agriculture chapter. And the first one is add that agricultural adaptation increases resilience in an evolving landscape. This key message is rather positive because there are a lot of negative things about climate change, but we have opportunities to uh, change the way we, we uh, operate our agricultural systems. The second key message is on climate change disrupts our food systems in uneven ways. And we'll get into some of the details there, but obviously some people are affected more than others. The third key message is rural communities face unique challenges and opportunities. And that's because of the uh, social dynamic in rural areas versus the urban areas. Next, please. So the first key message is gonna focus on this uh, Ad adaptation to uh, an evolving landscape. Next, please. Climate change has increased agricultural production risk by disrupting growing zones and growing days, which depend on precipitation, air temperature, and soil moisture. And we've seen evidence of that because the USDA heart plant hardiness zones have shifted, and they in, uh, they there seems to be a projection that they will shift further in the future. Next, please. Growing evidence for positive environmental and economic outcomes of conservation management has led some farmers and ranchers to adopt agroecological practices, which increase the potential for agricultural producers to limit greenhouse gas emissions and improve agricultural resilience to climate change. We have some confidence in many in both of these statements, and there's uh, increasing evidence that uh, we we can we need more we we need more information in some cases, but there's a good projection that we can actually make. Make some improvements. Next, please. To just give you a little bit of an example, the, the soil is, is really the foundation for a lot of our agricultural operations. And this is where uh, one area where I believe that the microbiology community has a large role to play. And that would be, say, say the habitat for organisms in soil or, or in nearby water bodies. And of course, the it's all focused on the greenhouse gas emissions and uptake that, that occur uh, with the, between the atmosphere and the land. And this is a very important part because most of those are, are microbial driven. Uh, it's also involved, uh, microbiology is involved in nutrient cycling. And so nutrient cycling is, is, a, is a key aspect. It's been studied for a long time, but we need to know more about the organisms that function in, in the soil and provide that function and how much redundancy there is. And so there's a great opportunity for microbiology to be involved in this and we need to have a sustainable uh, land ethic. Next, please. So the biophysical part is really focused in, in, on the soil there, but agriculture is much more than just the biophysical. And so we have these technological and social aspects that are also part of it. Agriculture is changing and it's not the, like it was in the, in the past. And so we, what we want to put together is, is this agroecological paradigm where we have these interaction among the components basically to produce outcomes that we desire. We want to have sustained pro productivity. We want to have diverse landscapes 
We want to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, enhance soil health, reduce soil erosion, have cleaner water, have uh, less pest pressure, reliable profitability for the farmers, and healthier people and vibrant rural communities. These are all important for a sustainable and agroecological approach. Next, please. So the second key message is to cl uh, that climate change disrupts our food systems in uneven ways. Next. Climate change is projected to disrupt food systems in ways that reduce the availability and affordability of nutritious food with uneven economic impacts across society. Next, please. Impacts of climate change on other measures of human well-being are also distributed unevenly, such as worsening heat stress among farm workers and disruptions to the ability of subsistence-based peoples to access food through hunting, fishing, and foraging. So there are aspects of, of, the climate, of, the, of the agricultural system that are being affected negatively more in some communities than others. And the disruption with uh, COVID wasn't a good example that we, we rely on the industrialization, but it can be disrupted. Next, please. There are many different types of uh, perturbations that uh, climate change can uh, create. The, each region may not experience all of these uh, types of perturbations, whether that's wildfire fires or hurricanes or extreme rainfall, uh, changing seasonality. These are all things that can happen and they can happen at different stages of the production system or, or the uh, food production system. At the production stage in the field, at the storage or processing and distribution, in the retail markets and in the consumption patterns. So there are many aspects there. Uh, it, uh, certainly food microbiology is important, and this is something where, where uh, the disruptions could be really relevant for microbiology as well. Next, please. One other aspect is that there are um, increased risks to food security in, in multiple ways. And there are uh, three kind of cases studies here. There, food is unavailable, food is inaccessible, or food is unusable. Just to uh, bore down into one of these, food is unusable due to invasive species displacing traditional food sources, uh, which would cause culturally and or religiously inappropriate food. These, these cases uh, help us understand that, that uh, it, it's not just about the food production and distribution, but there are, are uh, social aspects associated with our consumption of food. Next, please. Third key message is on rural communities facing unique challenges and opportunities. This is something that uh, for those that uh, live in rural communities, it's, it's something that you can see uh, daily. Rural communities steward much of the nation's land and natural resources, which provide food, bio, bio products, and ecosystem services. It's a key aspect of, of, of our, our farming community. Next, please. These crucial roles are at risk as climate change compounds existing stressors such as poverty, unemployment, and depopulation. And we've seen that the, the, the move towards urban areas is continues even in the United States as well as around the world. Opportunities exist for rural communities to increase their resilience to climate change and protect rural livelihoods. So we have one, one example to, to share with you on, on this uh, key message. Next, please. And that's uh, on the baseline re resilience indicators for communities. There are various aspects of that, whether that's on community capital, economic uh, aspects, environmental, infrastructure, institutional, or social. And they have both uh, positive and negative attributes there. And just in, in uh, for um, highlighting the environmental, that there are the rural communities are a great place to uh, create natural flood buffers and to have energy efficiency. But they're also at risk of uh, flood risk yeah, or or even dust uh, storms or or uh, hurricane effects and we of course we have energy inefficiency that that needs to be addressed as well so with that uh, that's a kind of a summary of the three key messages I'd like to end by letting you know that you can find this uh, chapter at the, the global change uh, website the nca2023.globalchange.gov and look for chapter 11 and I welcome your, your comments, your feedback, and uh, the co-authors uh, will do so as well. So thanks so much. And I'll pass it over to Dr. Goris. Excellent, thank you so much. So again, my name is Morgan Goris. I am a staff scientist at Los Alamos National Laboratory. And I have the honor today of covering the highlights of chapter 15, the human health chapter. 
And I am uh, just one of the 20 authors that contributed to this chapter. Um, so for this overview, I'm gonna cover the three key messages we highlight within the human health chapter and some other health-related themes relevant to microbiology throughout the chapter and report, and provide some examples of where I think the ASM community could maybe build upon or consider these findings. Next slide. So the first key message that we highlight is climate change is harming human health. Uh, it is an established fact that climate change is harming physical, mental, spiritual, and community health and well-being throughout in, uh, through the increasing frequency and intensity of extreme events, increasing cases of infectious diseases and vector-borne diseases, and declines in food and water quality and security. We highlight that climate-related hazards will continue to grow, increasing morbidity and mortality across all regions of the U.S. And we uh, divide our key message one into a variety of different subsections that dive into more specific examples. Next slide. So one of these examples is that drought can decrease water quantity and quality, leading to increased exposure to bacteria and other contaminants. We know that increased periods of drought have been connected to increased arsenic concentrations in drinking wells. Diarrheal diseases caused by pathogens tend to increase in drought-affected areas due to limited safe drinking water. And drought also uh, increases regional risk of West Nile virus. Uh, the hypothesis here being that limited water resources uh, bring together the viral host, the birds, the viral vector, mosquitoes, and humans that ultimately end up contracting West Nile. Uh, wildfires are increasing and result in poor air quality, uh, something that um, I thought ties into the ASM community is considering what microbes are present in smoke, which is something we did not report on in this uh, national climate assessment, but may be um, of interest to your research and include in future assessments. And a bit tying into drought, waterborne and uh, foodborne pathogens are expected to increase. On the right hand side is a graph of trends in vibriosis cases in the US by species from one of the papers we cited in the report where we echo their findings that vibriosis cases are projected to increase by over 50% uh, by the end of the 21st century for our moderate climate warming scenario, RCP 4.5, due to warming waters, changing salinity, and sea level rise. Next slide. Extreme weather events and slow onset disasters also contribute to adverse mental and spiritual health outcomes. Uh, we report uh, one in six mothers with low income experience continued post-traumatic stress symptoms 12 years after Hurricane Katrina, really highlighting the ongoing stress that folks experience um, in the wake of these extreme weather events. Uh, we echo findings that uh, many survivors of California's deadliest wildfire, the 2018 Camp Fire, experienced post-traumatic stress, depression, and anxiety related to home loss and community disruption. Climate change is also expected to alter the distribution, abundance, and seasonality of pathogens and infectious diseases. Next slide. And we highlight a variety of uh, these impacts through figure 15.2, uh, showing regional examples of climate-sensitive infectious diseases. In our human health chapter, we report um, findings um, from a lot of different um, disease vectors and hosts and environmental pathogens uh, through the uh, research output in the past few years, showing sporadic encephalitis outbreaks from mosquito-borne diseases. Uh, Lyme disease cases are increasing. There's been increased exposure to rabies in Alaska. And this is especially important for residents who practice subsistence hunting. There are projections of increased range in cases of valley fever and infectious fungal disease that's currently endemic in the southwestern United States. Found support that climate influences cryptococcus concentrations, another fungal pathogen. 
um, but a bit counterintuitive to what you'd, you'd originally think. Um, warming climate decreases uh, crypto concentration. So it's important to remember that uh, climate change may not exacerbate all um, climate sensitive infectious diseases, but rather shift distributions of diseases or maybe uh, change what diseases are most important in certain regions. And we also found that uh, uh, cases of PAM or primary amoebic meningoencephalitis ca caused by the amoeba uh, Nagleria fowleri have been increasing further north, uh, indicating a potential range expansion. So a variety of examples of um, climate sensitive infectious diseases. Next slide. For our second key message, we found systemic racism and discrimination exacerbate climate impacts on human health. Climate change unequivocally worsens physical, mental, spiritual, and community health and well being, as well as social inequities. It's an established fact that climate related uh, impacts disproportionately harm communities and people who have been marginalized. These include BIPOC individuals and communities with low wealth, women, people with disabilities or chronic diseases, sexual and gender minorities, and children. So the subsections that we included to support key message two uh, highlight the impacts on these communities and include subsections for tribal and indigenous people's health, persons with disabilities health, African-American and Latinx people's health, women's health, and sexual and gender minorities health. Next slide. And some of the supporting facts for key message two is that climate change creates intergenerational inequities as younger generations must endure more extreme weather events. We have a supporting figure uh, shown on the right-hand side here, figure 15.4, showing intergenerational inequity. So what we're looking at are different climate change attributable impacts to health on the x-axis, including wildfires, river floods, and crop failure. And then, then how many more times folks will experience that on the y-axis. And three different global warming scenarios above pre-industrial levels where the darker red color is the highest warming. We report already 70% of Superfund sites are located within one mile of federally assisted housing. So considering um, for something to consider for the ASM community is can microbes maybe be a solution here for environmental cleanup for some of these Superfund sites? And in 2020, 10.5% of US households were food insecure with higher rates reported among populations that have been marginalized. We know that crop pathogens like um, wheat rust or other fungal blights may exacerbate this. Uh, so again, how might microbes either be a solution to this problem or continue to impact food insecurity? Next slide. Our third key message in this chapter is that timely, effective, and culturally appropriate adaptation and mitigation actions protect human health. In every sector of society, implementing timely, effective, and culturally appropriate adaptation measures, creating climate resist resilient health systems, and preventing the release of greenhouse gases can protect human health and improve health equity. So we stress this in a variety of subsections, touching upon some of the subsections again that, was, that were in our other key messages, like wildfires and vector-borne diseases. Next slide. So we found that human health was protected when health was mainstreamed into food systems, infrastructure, water, and sanitation policies. So something to consider for the ASM community is can microbes accelerate the production of healthy foods? Uh, implementing disease surveillance systems uh, for climate sensitive infectious diseases like West Nile virus and non-infectious health outcomes like heat stroke uh, protected human health. Uh, this increases disease awareness among both physicians and the community and reduces health impacts from uh, climate disasters. 
Um, something to consider here is that uh, research in this area really depends on a variety of different resources. So are you sampling for pathogenic microbes in your research? And are you sharing your findings um, upon publication so that other members within the geohealth community and climate and health community can use this work uh, to expand upon uh, research in this field? And then we um, report that highly vulnerable areas also have high economic losses from climate hazards. On the right-hand side is another figure from our chapter showing social vulnerability and climate hazard impacts. Um, the top left map showing social vulnerability where the most vulnerable communities are in the darkest pink colors. The top right map showing climate sensitive um, hazard losses where the uh, darker colors are increasing losses. And then a combination of these two in the bottom panel showing combined social vulnerability and losses. The darker purple colors showing increasing losses. So something for the ASM community to consider is, are you considering environmental inequities in your research and your findings? Next slide. Another table of interest to the ASM community uh, as it relates to microbes and health um, is found in chapter eight, the ecosystems chapter. I wanted to highlight this because it shows climate impacted disease risk in humans and wildlife. Uh, most of these are all caused by microbes. So I encourage the ASM community to consider how your research may expand upon the impacts of these diseases or advocate for new diseases to be added to this list. Next slide. And then last, one of the focus on boxes was COVID-19 and climate change. In this box, we report that climate change can increase the likelihood of pandemics like COVID-19 and worsen their impacts. Climate-driven changes in ecosystems increase the risk of emerging infectious diseases by altering interactions among humans, pathogens, and animals, and changing social and biological susceptibility to infection. And lastly, over half of known human pathogenic diseases are exacerbated by climate change, particularly zoonotic and vector-borne diseases. So some of the findings in, in our key messages in the human health chapter also echoed in this focus on box in COVID-19. And this great figure on the right-hand side shows um, how changes in the average climate conditions and more extreme events can affect human animal and vector interactions, as well as um, put us more susceptible to uh, pandemics and cause emerging and novel diseases. Uh, last slide. Uh, so this is an uh, overview of the human health chapter. Um, and I'd like to mention for any other early career um, scientists on the line that um, I'm, I was definitely the most early career scientist of the human health chapter, arguably one of the most early career scientists or authors among um, the whole national climate assessment. Um, and I was one of the scientists to nominate myself for chapter authorship, and I would highly recommend you considering being involved in the NCA process as well. Uh, so I will go ahead and end there, and I think hand it over uh, to Jay or Aaron. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank, every, thank you, everyone, for those great presentations and overview of the NCA and the, the different focus of the chapters. Uh, we've now scheduled uh, some time for some some questions uh, that you might have. Um, if you would like to uh, uh, raise your hand on Zoom, uh, we, we can moderate questions that way. Or if you feel more comfortable, you can put them into the chat and uh, we'll try to um, ask questions of our three speakers. I have one question that I'd like to um, ask. Maybe we can get things rolling. Uh, I wonder if there's any aspects to the NCA, um, the fifth assessment that you think is is currently under discussed and you'd like to see more and focus on the, in the future assessments. And th that's open to any of the, um, of the speakers. Well, this is Alan. Uh, I would like to comment or re reply back in that I don't have a specific uh, place where there was it was on re underrepresented but 
be informed that the NCA5 is really a summary document and it's not really a, a review or synthesis of scientific literature. It is a, an interpretation that is, uh, the reading material is was made for the general public. That was our message. And so the, the information has to be simplified, uh, but it has to take complex interactions that uh, are what we study as scientists, but it has to be distilled to uh, key messages. And that's, that's the important part and I think that's a that's a good challenge for the microbiology community as well because oftentimes uh, microbiology scientists are, are perhaps uh, in, in in a laboratory where you may not have opportunities to interact with the public but that is really important in this case because climate change as you've seen affects many different aspects of our livelihoods. Mm -hmm. Alan, if it's okay, I'd like to follow up a question on your presentation. I noticed in many instances you you qualified some of the conclusions based on the degree of certainty. And I think this is really important for scientists today who are trying to communicate uh, their their work to the general public. Uh, is that something that comes across in the chapters, or is that something that you tried to uh, you know pepper in in presentation for for, for today? Because uh, I think that's a really important issue about certainty that we have about the effects of climate change on various aspects of microbial and, and global health. Well, I, I could respond. Thanks for the question, Jay. But I'll let, I, actually, I'm going to put it on Aaron to see if maybe he has a, a little bit of more of an overview, because I, I, I believe that the, it was something that was uh, dictated uh, that we do have some cer certainty for all of the key messages. Yeah. But uh, I'll, I'll let Aaron comment further on that. Yes. Um, so the answer is yes. All Every key message in the National Climate Assessment includes something called calibrated language. And um, and the IPCC also does this. Um, and basically, the idea is that we, we have the authors come to a consensus finding on the likelihood of something occurring, if likelihood is appropriate for that and then their confidence in that statement based on their assessment of the literature. And so um, the human health chapter also had that, I think uh, for readability, perhaps they, they pulled out those, those, uh, com that confidence language, but that is in all of the key messages. And if you click on a likelihood statement, a little pop-up comes up and it tells you what each of those words, what does likely mean? Um, and it gives you kind of a, a percent likelihood and then what does medium confidence mean for example but it is definitely a challenge um how do you communicate to um diverse groups of stakeholders including policymakers, about um likelihood and confidence but it is incredibly important that we do get through our our confidence and the likelihood of our statements occurring great thank you um jeff i see that your hands uh, up would you like to ask a question. I just want to sort of respond to this discussion because there was a comment in the chat as well about communicating with general audiences. I think too often when we say communicate, we mean communi communicate to, not communicate with. And my sense is, and I, I'm happy to be corrected, is that a lot of this content is being pushed out, but there aren't really opportunities for feedback and input from that broader audience to the processes that are being described and dictated. Now, that's, of course, an opportunity, and it's something that we, me in particular, focus a lot on here at ASM is sort of that public communication and engagement efforts. But I would wonder what sort of, I know there's a lot of different climate things going on, but how those efforts are taking in inputs from broader audiences outside of sort of technical experts and incorporating that not only into the work that's done, but sort of the content that is being produced so that it's more of a dialogue and conversation than just like a dissemination of information. Yeah, maybe I'll start with this and I'll let the, the other panelists chime in, but uh, at the USGCRP team, we are thinking a lot about this and um, it the the government processes do present challenges and barriers but during this assessment we really did try to communicate early and often with as many stakeholders as possible um so we started with the public comment period at the zero order draft which is basically an annotated outline 
to try to hear from folks what exactly they wanted in the assessment in the first place. And we had a series of uh, public engagement workshop webinars um, that we hosted on every single chapter where the authors received input from the public. And we did our best to work with the authors to invite as many people who are interested in this as possible. And of course, you get a lot of practitioners, a lot of policymakers, a lot of academics, but we did hear from a lot of members of the public at large as well. In addition to that, um, it kind of starts with who's on the author teams. In addition to academic researchers, we had folks from the private sector, we had folks from nonprofit and uh, you know groups that, that work on those sorts of things. We had um, indigenous and tribal peoples. So we, you, we um, worked with tribes and indigenous communities to incorporate traditional ecological knowledge and indigenous knowledge and had, had a process for that as well. Um, and we could always do better. And we're trying to sort of come around now that this is out and we're presenting information to folks, but we also have reg regional workshops planned in every region of the country to invite interested folks in to have a dialogue with us. And um, a few people on our author teams as well uh, set up a youth dialogue um, webinar and workshop, which was highly successful. And we want to integrate that as a more formal process because youth are a huge group that are super engaged in the climate change um, space. So I, I think we could always do better, but we, we've really started um, trying to close the loop on this and incorporate as many voices as possible. I don't know, Morgan or Alan, if you want to speak to your chapter specifically. Erin, something that I'll add is that uh, the U.S. Global Change Research Program is also hosting the NCA5 webinar series where they're going over uh, each of the uh, chapters with an hour-long webinar. So I'll put the link for those um, in the chat. And then I was uh, going to em emphasize the uh, author team uh, diversity. I was extremely proud of that within the human health chapter, pulling from um, folks at universities, uh, folks in, in tribal nations, and um, Boston Children's Hospital, and just making sure we had a great representative author team. Perfect. And I'll chime in also just a one, one little um, ad addition is that I, I would stress, yes, that it, it, the zero order draft, we had very much uh, public input uh, to address the issues that were of importance. And I can say uh, faithfully that one of our key message was actually formulated to to be that 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 our first key message on adapting to a, uh, a changing landscape. This was a, an issue that was important to many of our public stakeholders that they wanted to see that agriculture has problems, but agriculture has solutions too, and they wanted to see the positive aspects of that. And so there, there was really strong um, reaction to that. And so we, we did address that. And I would say also that in, individually, it's it's for scientists, it's it's easy to have discussion or dialogue with stakeholders. For for larger organizations, it's a little bit more difficult. But I think the process of laying out the webinars, of asking for feedback, these this is one way we can actually gain input, and maybe it will inform the next uh, NCA six, something like that. Thank you. Um, so, in the interest of time, we'll take one more question. And Jennifer's had her her hand raised for a second. So, um, uh, Jen. Oh, I was just wondering if. Um... One or more of you could speak to the process a little bit. Like, how do you get 500 people to write this report? How does it come out? Thanks. I guess I, I could, from the perspective of a staffer who was point of contact for several chapters, um, it's huge. It's a it's a huge project. There's so many authors, so many moving parts, so many deadlines. It's it's a strange integration of like federal and non-federal people on a federal report. So there's like federal review processes you have to navigate. Um, and I really want to credit our director, um, Allison Crimmins, who was um, incredible and instrumental at keeping everyone on task and motivated and happy and engaged. Um, and also our chief of staff, Chris Avery. But it's, um, and this started uh, right before the pandemic and then everyone went remotely. So they all had that challenge as well. But um, 
I, I just, it, it's an interesting organizational issue and it was definitely a big project management challenge, but we also have help from a technical support unit in Asheville, uh, North Carolina, who works on the figures and editorial and website development. And they even have a tool called ACE that's an internal um, project management tool that we used as well. So I'll, I'll hand it over to the, to the other panelists to speak from the author perspective, but it, it worked surprisingly well and we hit all of our deadlines amazingly and, and got this great report out. So, uh, you know, kudos to, to the team for that. I don't really have anything to add, but I can add only that it was, it, it was a very long process and it was very methodical. And so that is the important part. You got to stick with it. And, and also it's a team. So you rely on your team members. There are certain aspects that uh, individuals can provide and then you rely on your team members, but you have to play well together. Thank you. I think the only thing I'll add is that within the human health chapter, uh, we kind of had our own sections that we were the champions of. And so with each of our diversified backgrounds, you know, the, the folks that are focused on uh, heat impacts on health, really focused on the heat section, my background being more on environmental infectious diseases, I focused on that section and disease surveillance. So uh, definitely a lot of dividing and conquering, but then uh, supporting each other and making sure we're not repeating information. Um, and we're also uh, tapping into the regional chapters to uh, mm -hmm. highlight important regional health impacts. Um, so at one of our all author meetings in DC, uh, we were actually going room to room to chat with other chapter authors to coordinate. I noticed there are some questions in the chat relating to things like agriculture and soils and microbiomes and regional issues that you just mentioned, Morgan, uh, specifically plant pests in Alaska. Uh, we, we're now going to move to breakout groups where we have three uh, questions that we'll use to guide our discussion. So I urge you all to stay online and we'll break out and you'll have an opportunity perhaps to discuss with some of the speakers um, some of these topics and the scope of these questions. Um, I don't know if we have those on a slide right now, but I can uh, also read them off to help uh, um, get those planted into your heads. The questions are, how would you like the NSA, NCA, um, how does it uh, apply to your work? Uh, what climate information needs are there in your specific, uh, presumably geographic area, but perhaps also the, your area of specialty as it relates to science? And what would you like to see in the future assessment? We've already heard that the planning has begun for the sixth uh, assessment and there's opportunities to get involved in that. Um, and so my job now is just in closing to thank you again, um, especially the panelists for participating and everyone else for joining. Um, and if you're not already a member of ASM's advocacy and climate change mailing list, please sign up and also please sign up for the NCA um, a link that was sent out today so you can get alerts on how to become involved either as a reviewer or as a potential author of the, the sixth assessment that will be coming out in the future. So uh, again, thanks everyone, especially the speakers for participating and uh, we'll, we'll keep you posted on any new advancements um, in, AS, in the Academy's um, climate change portfolio. Thanks again. <laughs>